welcome and thank you for joining with me. Uh, if you want to follow along with me, we're going to be in Psalm chapter 34 today as we continue on looking at digging deeper into the scriptures. So last week we looked at looking from the outside and we looked at the narrative found in 1 Samuel chapter 21 and we looked a little bit at chapter 20 and chapter 22 as well. And this week, now we're gonna look from the inside. So the outside was looking at just kind of the narrative, what we see um, from the events that transpire, but looking from the inside, as we look at the Psalm that David wrote, we're gonna be kind of seeing the inner heart of David, what was going on in his soul, what was the actions he was going through that were transpiring during those events that we read in 1 Samuel. And I think we're gonna find that uh, there's a little bit deeper meaning to some of those things that we looked at at 1 Samuel. Now this is going to continue on, so we're not going to be able to cover everything right now because we're going to have to lay a little bit of groundwork now for the psalm. But hopefully over the weeks we're going to slowly see everything kind to uh, come together. So in Psalm 34, it's important for us to know not only is this going to help us understand better the narrative that we looked at last week, but it's also a psalm that's important for us that those of us that are feeling alone or feeling desolate or those of us that feel like the world's kind of caving in around us it's a psalm that can really speak to us with that because again it, it transpired during the events that we looked at last week and though there was some joyous things that was happening for david there was also some great heartache that was happening during those times too and so this is david crying out of his heart of what was happening during that time so Psalm 34, we're, we're going to break it up into two different sections just because the author wrote the psalm uh, in that way that it can be easily broken up into two different sections. So we're going to look at the first half of Psalm 34 this week. And in particular, we're going to look at the different parts of the first part of the psalm. Uh, and it's broken up into three different sections as well. So the first part we're going to be looking at is talking about praising Yahweh and the heart that David has for doing that. So starting off in Psalm 34, starting in verse 1, and we're going to read through verse 3. I will bless Yahweh at all times. His praise shall continually be on my mouth. My soul makes its boast in Yahweh. Let the humble hear and be glad. Oh, magnify Yahweh with me, and let us exalt his name together. So, in these first three verses, we see that David communicates in synonymous terms, meaning kind of saying the same thing in multiple different ways, how he praises Yahweh. And he says that he does it all the time. He says, I will bless Yahweh all the time the time. This means even during the times that things are going rough. Again, for David, this was the narrative of 1 Samuel chapter 21. Things were not going good for David at this time. He was fearing for his life. He was isolated and lacking in connection with his loved ones. And even during those times, he says, may I bless the Lord. And he says, my soul makes its boast in Yahweh. David had a lot he could have been complaining about. But instead he chooses to boast in God and see the positive in what is going on. There's many things for David to boast about and there are many things that we can boast about in the Lord as well. On a personal level, many of us purposely chose to disobey the declarations of God on how we were to live our lives. We chose to separate ourselves from God's presence. But, in God's grace, He's given us a second, third, fourth, fifth chance to come back into His favor. And how many times have we made a mockery of the Bride of Christ? By either criticizing in front of other people, another Christian, or in ourselves doing actions that were a mockery of what Christ has asked us to be. 
We chose to misrepresent Christ to a world who was looking at the members of the church as a representation of Jesus. We should have been cast out a long time ago. But God is slow to anger and patient with us. And that is something to boast about. There are times that we get in over our heads. Or we back ourselves into a corner. Some of us, it might have been, we forgot to do our homework. But then God comes in and he rescues us. And all of a sudden, school is delayed. And we have the time to be able to make up that homework now. Or maybe we weren't prepared for the, the meeting that we have for work and the meeting gets canceled. God comes to our rescue. We're in a situation where somebody's seeking advice from us and we have no idea what to say, but then all of a sudden words just start coming out of our mouths that we don't know where they're coming from, that we're learning just as much as the person that we're counseling, as God gives us the words to speak. Or there's some situation that lies before us and we have no idea what to do, so we just try something and it works. And again, God comes in and he works through our hands and makes it prosperous what we're trying to do. There are many ways that we can boast in what God has done for us in so many of these situations, but it's not just what he's done for us. We can boast in the Lord of who he is. Let's take a moment to, to think about that boasting that we have in Christ. God has no beginning or end. He always has been, and he always will be. That's an exciting thing and a reassurance in a world that's constantly changing. We have a stability that is unchanging in our lives. That Yahweh is complete. He doesn't depend on anything outside of himself. He cannot fall apart, and he has no logical limits to himself. Yahweh never changes. I mean, we've we looked at that in a way, but just to really grasp that idea that he doesn't change, that what he tells us he's always going to stay faithful to. He's not like a human being that's going to change his name, or, or change his ways, I mean, or or like the wind that blows this way one time and the next, next day. We know that what he says is going to happen. His authority reigns over all. All those who choose to accept him as their Lord and Savior and all those people who refuse to even acknowledge his existence. He reigns over everybody. Nothing is impossible with our God. There's nowhere we can be taken or go that he won't be with us. He knows all things past. He knows all things present. He knows all things future. And he knows all potentials. God is not far from any one of us. He's present and active in our lives. He is the one that holds all things together. If he was to let go, the world would fall apart. He is the definition of good. As we're trying to figure out in this world what is the right and wrong things to do, what is good, what is evil, if it wasn't for God's standards, then it would all be subjective. It would just be up to the individual to choose what is good and what is wrong. But God has given us a definition in his word of this is what I declare is good because it flows from me. Yahweh is not partial. He cannot be bribed. We don't have to worry about injustice coming from God because somebody changes his mind or convinces him otherwise because what they can offer him. It's impossible for God to lie. He can't lie to us if it's impossible for him to do so. It's beyond his nature. That's why he can't do it. So when we say nothing's impossible to God, it means anything logically for him. God cannot deny himself. He can't go against his own nature. And so he's not going to lie because it's against his nature. He can't commit a logical fallacy. As the saying goes, God cannot create a square circle. 
because by definition a square does not fit the definition of a circle. It's an illogical statement. So God doesn't do things that are illogical. So nothing that illogical is is God going to do, but he can do all things that are logical. And so lying would be outside the realm of who he is that's illogical. So he is held back from being able to do something like that. He's never given up on you and I, even when we give up on ourselves. And he died a humiliating and torturous death for you and I. There's so much to boast in with God, and we've only scratched the surface. May this praise come from us in our thoughts, our prayers, of thanksgiving, and our conversations with others. David went on, though, to say, let the humble hear and be glad. The Bible tells us that no one is righteous. And the humble recognize that this includes them. The humble understand that they haven't reached perfection. That they're on a journey of sanctification with God and they have a long ways to go. Therefore, they seek out instruction from God's word so they can grow in areas of good and remove the filth from their lives. These people, the humble, will listen to the declarations of God and grow. And it is great rejoicing to them to hear the boasting of God because they realize there's something they can grow from hearing it. And David declared in verse 3 that may we magnify Yahweh. I love this imagery. I mean, think of like the pond water illustration we're always given with the microscope. That you put pond water under a microscope and you see creatures and objects in that water that are not able to be uh, visible from a distance. That it's only through the magnification that you recognize there's something there that you didn't see before. And this same idea applies to magnifying God. We're helping people see God in greater detail helping them see things that normally they would overlook. And so by doing this, we exalt his name by speaking the excellency of Yahweh to influence people's opinion of who he is. So those first three verses, let's read them again. I will bless Yahweh at all times. His praise shall be continually in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in Yahweh. Let the humble hear and be glad. Oh, magnify Yahweh with me and let us exalt his name together. So in summary, what are these three verses declaring? David starts by praising God at all times. This continuous praise brings joy to those who are humble in heart. The result of this joy is that others join David in praising God. Let us exalt his name together, it said in verse 3. It's a contagious thing. We start by boasting in God. It brings joy to those who are humble and then they join in with our praise as well. It's a wonderful thing. Now in the next four verses, David is going to go into Yahweh's preservation, what it meant for him in his life. So he's talking about even during these trials and these hard times in his life, he's praising God, and here's what God did for him during those rough times. Starting in verse 4, reading through verse 7. I sought Yahweh, and he answered me, and delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant. Their faces shall never be ashamed. This poor man cried and Yahweh heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of Yahweh encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. In these four verses, 
It conveys how seeking Yahweh leads to preservation. In verse 7, it takes this idea of seeking and it frames it in the light of God's current presence among those who fear Him. So it's saying the same concept but wording it in a different manner. So the first thing that David starts off with is saying that he sought Yahweh. And that's an important thing for us to know. And that whole narrative that we read in 1 Samuel, David says, I sought God during that time. And we can learn from God's comfort that he gives to Asa in 2 Chronicles chapter 15 in the latter part of verse 2. And here, God speaking through the prophet is telling Asa about a guarantee of finding Yahweh if he would seek him. And so this comfort that comes from this passage is both for the, the heathen who doesn't believe in the existence of God, but it's also for the believer as well. No matter what they're going through, the joys of life or the struggles of life, if they seek God, they will find him. And this is what that passage says in the latter half of verse 2. Yahweh is with you while you are with him. If you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will forsake you. Now it doesn't mean that when he forsakes you that he's given up on you, but it's meaning if you will not seek him out, God is not going to force himself upon you. So he's going to say, you don't want me? Okay, I'm going to accept that. That's what it means by forsaking them. But if we seek out God, he says, it's a guarantee I will be there. He's not going to leave us hanging. All right, we will be right there. And that's what happened with David. David sought out Yahweh knowing that God was going to answer him. He was going to be there for David. And what does he do? He delivered him from all his fears. People will sometimes try to encourage us with our fears. We'll have something that we're struggling with in our lives and, and without knowing what to say or to do, a lot of times they'll just tell us, oh, don't worry about it, everything will be fine. And really there's no justification for those statements. They just don't want us to be sad. They, don't, they want to take away our anxiety. And so they're saying, everything's going to be great. You know, probably the epitome of this is the war movies that we watch where the guy's half blown apart and he's laying on the ground and he's ready to give his last letter uh, to the individual, you know, give this to my wife. And the guy's sitting there going, everything's going to be okay. You're going to make it through this. And from the outside, you see, yeah, this guy's about ready to die any moment now. They're lying to him for whatever reason to try to bring him comfort or something. But we unintentionally kind of do that in normal conversations of, you're, you're scared, you're upset, I, I don't want you to be, so I'm just going to tell you, don't be afraid. And that kind of falls on deaf ears. It doesn't really help in those times that we're really panicking. But it could be different, so, so let's put us in a context. Say that you have a surgery coming up and you're really nervous about it. And so your friends are like, oh, don't worry about it, everything's going to be fine. But what your mind goes through is all the things that can go wrong. But what happens when you're sitting in the doctor's office and the surgeons, they're with you and says, ah, don't worry, everything's going to be great. We've done this surgery tons of times. There's hardly been anybody who's ever had a complication, and those who have had a complication, there was a reason for it, and they give details. It's going to mean a lot more when the surgeon tells you, don't worry, because they are bringing more to the table to be able to help comfort you in those moments. They have knowledge and information. They're the ones doing the work. It has a lot more weight to it. It's the same thing with God. God's comfort isn't like the individual just trying to encourage us with empty words. It is the comfort of our Creator coming to us and saying, I've got this. When God delivers you from your fears, we got to remember, and we've talked about this before, but it's so important to make sure it's in our head. It doesn't mean that the situation is always going to change. And it doesn't always mean the anxiety is going to go away. David had it both ways. He did have a reprieve with God intervening into his life. He did get food, we read. He did find a weapon. He did get to escape from Achish, the king of the Philistines. But there is 
troubles that didn't change in David's situation. Saul was still seeking his life. He was still separated from his best friend. He was still all alone. So there's still hardships that were going on in David's life. And so sometimes God's comfort, yes, is removing us from the situation, but sometimes it's only part of the situation, like David. And so there's still part of what we're struggling with, we're still going through, and not everything is relieved for us. And some of the comfort of God is knowing that he is in the messiness of life with us. I love these two verses from Isaiah that help give us comfort in this. The first one's from Isaiah chapter 43, verse 1. But now, thus says Yahweh, He who created you, O Jacob, He who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. Now, if you remember those passages, we've had a message on this, so I'm not going to go too in-depth in here, but it is important for us to recognize that it is our Creator. There's nobody who could know us better than the one who has designed us. And God is reassuring us, I've created you. You are mine. I know you so intimately. I know you. I call you by name. Do not fear. And there can be great comfort that comes to us recognizing that. And then here's where the relational side of God comes in. And I cannot do this passage justice, so it's only by the grace of the Holy Spirit that he can work this out into your life. But Isaiah chapter 41, verse 13. For I, Yahweh, your God, hold your right hand. It is I who say to you, Fear not. I am the one who helps you. This is powerful. God's saying, I, I am holding your right hand. Right hand in that culture spoke of power. So he is our strength. But the visual imagery here is just amazing. Picture yourself there weeping with whatever it is you're going through or the fear and the anxiety that you have coming your way. And it is though God's come up and he's grabbed your two hands right there in front of your face, holding you to comfort you and looking in your eyes and saying, fear not. I'm the one to help you. Say, I am right here with you with whatever it is that you're going through. What imagery that is there of God holding our hands as our heart is breaking and him reassuring Attaching that with Isaiah 41, the one who's created us, who's purchased us back. Saying, don't be afraid. I'm right here. I'm going to help you with what you're struggling through. May we never forget that in those moments that we go through the hardships of life. In verse 5, he talked about those who look on him will be radiant. This means a bright complexion. And it stems from the joy that's inside the believer's heart. When we keep our eyes on him, it doesn't matter what situation we're going through, we can still have joy. The problem is the latter part of this verse, if we lose our sight on him and we're focused in on the troubles that are going on in our lives, the fears that we have in our lives, it is going to bring our countenance down. We're going to lose our joy. Not really lose it, we're going to give up our joy focusing on the things that we cannot control. And it's going to take away the, the life that is inside us. And people are going to be able to look at to us and say, oh, something's wrong. What's the matter? And that's not radiance at those moments. And there will be times we fall into that. I'm not saying that we shouldn't become those things. But may we strive to be those who are radiant life because we're looking so much at Christ and who he is that we've never lost the joy in amongst the hardship. And we're still able to have that brightness, that glow to us because our focus is on Him. And the verse 7 then, as it rephrases it, it says, the angel of Yahweh encamps around all those who fear Him. The phrase angel of Yahweh, a lot of times, and a lot of commentators say that this really is usually in 
in uh, reference to the pre-incarnate manifestation of Jesus. And that's a fancy way to say basically this is Jesus appearing as a human being before his birth in the gospel narratives. And it's a manifestation, meaning he's appeared in a visible form to us. So it's predating Jesus' physical birth on earth, but it is him appearing in the Old Testament. And there seems to be a lot of details with this angel of Yahweh being that of, of Christ. But no matter what you view this as, it's important to understand that this verse is in reference to God's immediate protection of his children. He's camped around them. It's like the, the passage that we read of Elijah where uh, his servant, his young servant, sees the army that's coming to, to take Elijah and him away captive and Elijah has to pray, God open his eyes so he can see the bigger picture and the young man sees the chariots of fire all around them. Seeing the realm of, of God's protection that was invisible before to him. And it kind of has that picture here of the angel of the Lord, speaking of his protection, is always around his chosen people. We just might not always see that. So may we not forget that. God is holding our hands, saying, don't worry about this. I'm right here with you. He's camped all around us. His host of his angelic realm is there to fight our battles for us, as long as we're trusting in him. And he's going to save us from all our troubles. So, Let's read these four verses again, and then let's summarize them. I sought Yahweh, and he answered me, and delivered me from all my fears. Those who looked on him are radiant, and their faces shall never be ashamed. This poor man cried, and Yahweh heard him, and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of Yahweh encamps around those who fear him, and delivers them. So here in this section we have another sequence of events. First, there's trouble in David's life. And we've seen this from the narrative in 1 Samuel chapter 21. We know David has left his friend, Jonathan. Saul wants to kill David. David is alone. He has no weapons at the time that he's writing this, or at the time that he's talking about in this text. Um, and he's without food. So he's running for his life, and he has nobody there with him. What is David's response to seek Yahweh through prayer? The result of seeking Yahweh through prayer is that God works on David's behalf to bring him deliverance. David was not put to shame, but, his, but has uh, joy knowing that God is with him. That kind of changes hopefully our perspective a little bit of the narrative we read about in 1 Samuel 21 about these weird actions that we read of David doing when we recognize he's telling us here in the psalm I sought the Lord out with this and he has delivered me through my seeking of him. This wasn't David just acting on his own saying this is how I'm going to handle this situation on my own. No, we're told in the psalm he prayed about it. He sought the Lord saying, I am in trouble. How do I get removed from this? Hopefully, it changes our heart a little bit of how we judged David's actions that we read about in the previous section. So now the last section we're going to look at in Psalm 34 today is David talking about obtaining the desirable. And this is verses 8 through 10. Oh, taste and see that Yahweh is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Oh, fear Yahweh, you his saints. For those who fear him have no lack. The young lion suffers want and hunger, but those who seek Yahweh lack no good thing. David starts off by saying to taste and see that Yahweh is good. This might kind of resonate a little bit weird uh, to us. We might have read it enough times that we've kind of lost the, the aspect or the, uh, the poetic device here. But it should rouse up a little bit of curiosity into us going, why are we eating God? 
why are we told to lick him or whatever it might be to be able to taste God? That's a weird concept to have. Know God, see God, maybe those things make a little bit of sense, but taste him? Out of all the senses, why does the author choose to taste God? Well, it's a figure of speech used to gain attention. If we think of like billboard signage, uh, I think of the Bowersock sign that was on um, US 12 for a while where the picture was upside down but the words were right side up. You're more likely that was to gain your attention because it was out of the ordinary. It was different than everything else and so your attention was drawn to that sign. It's a great marketing scheme. Well, scheme sounds like a bad terminology. A great marketing technique. <laughs> there we go. To gain your attention. That's kind of like this figure of speech. It does the same thing as like a food enhancer like salt does uh, for food. It brings out something extra into the text and that's what this figure of speech does. It's supposed to grab the, the listener's attention going, wait a minute, that's a weird concept. So if you're kind of dozing off or not really paying attention to the person reading God's law, it would kind of spice or get your attention back up again and that's what's happening here. So it's just speaking of, may you recognize and experience the goodness of God. So with this idea then of Yahweh is good, it's important that we see that the Lord is good because that's an understanding that God cares for you and I. We don't have to dread bad news. Because we know that God is going to establish our hearts and give us grace to handle whatever might come our way. Boy, God is good. We might not always recognize the goodness in the situation, but we understand that God is going to help us through that situation. No different than, again, the child who needs to get the immunization. And they're not going to see that as a good thing, but the parents do it knowing that it's for the greater good, maybe, of the child. And God has that with us, too. Sometimes we're so nearsighted that we just see, in the moment, the short term, but God sees eternity. And so sometimes he's even looking beyond the walk of this earth and looking for the salvation of another individual or the promotion of the gospel or our greater being in eternity. And so he's looking out for our good when we would sometimes choose the latter that is worse off for the short term. How many of us would choose to be martyred? I think most of us would sign the line that says, nope, you go through this life, everything goes fine and dandy, you die in your sleep at an old age. Awesome, sign me up for that. But we do read of great reward for those who are martyred for their faith. Now that still doesn't motivate me to want to sign up for that, but again, I put that in the Lord's hands. He knows what's best and what is, is needed. But on a fleshly level, I would always choose what is simplest and easiest and the benefit for me in the here and now. And then he ends of even the young lions suffer want and hunger. And in this text, I really think the young lions is to be taken as literal. They're not figurative speaking of a different type of individual. I think God is telling us here that even in his created animal kingdom, the strongest of the animals that was popular in that culture suffered want from time to time. Even the young lions suffered want and hunger. But that's contrasted with God's people who have no need to seek for what is good. Because since their eyes are on the Lord and they're seeking to please him, they naturally get what is good in their life. So even the best of the animal kingdom has to search for what is good, but God's people are never called to have to search for that as long as they've already sought out the Lord. That's the thing that we're supposed to seek for. When we're told to seek out for wisdom, look for it like buried treasure is speaking about God and his word. When our focus is on God, good will come from that. Not always on an earthly stance, but on an eternal, eternity level. So that's what we're going to go through today in the psalm. Next week, we'll look at the rest of the psalm, and we'll look at when David gets into the encouragement part of the psalm. But there's a lot here, and, and next week, we'll do a summary of it again and kind of bring it all kind of together, a little bit of the narrative that we read 
uh, last week in 1 Samuel, but hopefully we see the basics of what is going on here. David had a lot going on in his life. He was separated from loved ones. He was all alone. He was destitute. He had somebody trying to kill him. And in the midst of all that, he has all these weird dynamics that happen of having to get food from a priest and having to flee to the Philistines and then finding out they want to kill him and having to get away from that. And, and in this, David says, I had to cry out to God for help. God, help me. I don't know what to do in this situation. He says, God was faithful. And he comes down and he delivers me from these situations that I am in. And that is why he has so many reasons to boast in Yahweh. Not all the situation was totally gone. But he did. He helped him get food. He helped him get a weapon. He helped him to be delivered from the Philistines. He, he provided an avenue for him to go to a cave. And eventually, as we read later on in that narrative, that other people, 400 individuals, joined him in what he's doing. He does bring a reprieve of having individuals rally around David. But still, the ultimate thing, it's still years out before the threat of Saul is taken away. But God, David recognizes God is in this and his hand is moving. And hopefully you can apply that to your life as well. There are going to be some horrific things that happen in your life. And as you cry out to God, not every single one of those is going to go away. But may you have the great peace and comfort knowing that God has grabbed you by the hand and says, I am with you. I'm going to get you through this. I am your strength. Just come alongside me as we go through this. From the outside, from the rest of the world, it might look like you're doing some of the foolish things. And they might criticize the things that you're doing. But as long as your focus is on God and you're doing what God has asked you to do, then it doesn't matter what the rest of the world is crying out as long as your eyes are stay focused on the Lord and what he has called you to do. Thank you for taking this time to be with me uh, this week. I pray that you have a blessed rest of the week.